Welcome to our next episode where we explore some more of the myths and some more of the questions that we are often asked. I'm joined again by Heidi. Hello, Heidi. Hello, Yvonne. It's nice to be back. It's lovely to have you. And today we will pick up from where we left off last time. You may remember that we had just discussed Jeremy's holiday to the south of France and Saint-Tropez. And this has followed six days of intensive questioning by Essex police. Yeah, it's police. From a police officer, by the way, who you yeah, didn't like because of his attitude with you, was DS Stan Jones. So he had to sit with him well, for three of the six days. He was with him. Who was throwing barbels at him and saying, is that your mum's barbel? Why don't you pick it up and have a look? You know, entrapment issues going on. But Jeremy was questioned, did he have any legal representation with him at the time? No, he didn't. In fact, it was refused for the first two days. They asked him refused. Yes, it it even says on his uh, custody records that um, legal representation was refused. That's incredible. Now, interesting, that that was signed by DCI Jones, who everyone said that Jeremy liked talked around and he persuaded him he was innocent and this is DCI Jones who refused the solicitor presence so yeah, it was he was trying to get it. you know if there was any information to obtain he was trying to get it he wasn't instantly no no Jeremy's not done anything right I'm, I'm siding with Jeremy you know he did question him he did put, you know, particularly about the evidence that Julie Mugford had given um, but then, you know, when DCI Jones realised oh, right, he's innocent, DS Jones then took over. Well, that's a little, different kettle of fish then. So the questioning completely changed. And I'm not surprised Jeremy wanted a few days away after that. No, I'm not surprised either. Was it recorded? No, Any it wasn't his? recorded. No. See, this was pre paced So the Police and Criminal Evidence Act which brought into force that interviews with police had to be recorded so that they could be made transcribed later. That didn't happen. So I have Jeremy's custody records, and in them, they can, they, he was like taken for an interview room for like two hours, and the notes are like 10 lines. And it's like, really? So this one spoke about 10 Ten lines worth of hours. things in that two hours. And he was like, so it's supposed to give a uh, contempor- retrospective, sort of contemporaneous, I think the correct word is, um, yeah. an account of the interviews that were given. So and then Jeremy had to initial that that's what had been discussed. But, you know, it's not accurate. There's no accuracy. And we do not have the interviews of Julie Mugford. We have no notes. We have absolutely nothing. So what was said in her interviews? We have absolutely no idea at all. No, that means that Essex Police are still sitting on that information then. Essex Police still have the um, notes or, or the transcripts, what the, the notes that they've made them, the contemporaneous account of Julie Mugford's interviews with them. Coincidentally, conducted by DS Dan Jones, who was like 32 times he saw her, 32 times from the 8th of August, Doctor. sorry, from the 7th of September, <laughs> after that bit again, 32 times D.S. Mm. Jones made sure that he saw Julie Mugford between the 7th of September 1985 and the beginning of the trial. So it seems a little bit That's odd. Shocking, isn't it? Yeah, that it's the same police officer continually. Was he grooming her into giving the evidence he wanted her to give? I don't know, and we'll never know because we don't have those notes. They won't disclose the interview notes. So could he have been See, threatening when, when her? Something, when something's withheld, which is what the police are doing now, you wonder what are they hiding? Just exactly. hand it over because then we can all have a look. But if you hold something back, you're putting a big question mark over what was really said, what was really done, what are you, why are you withholding this information, in other words? Because exactly. you've got no reason to hold it. If you're not, if you've nothing to I'm cover up, I'd like to know. I'd like to know the whole story. You know what did Julie Mugford say? I'm you sure. Know what was in all these different reports? 
Exactly. And I'm sure that if it was evidence that was against Jeremy, oh, it would have been out there immediately. Because this will be oh, evidence absolutely. that supports well, Jeremy, it supports his innocence yeah. and supports his almost 36-year fight for justice. But that is the reason they are not disclosing it. I mean, the police solicitor, Essex police solicitor, wrote to us and said, oh, yeah, we've got this information, We've got, but you're not having it. I mean, that's, that's just okay. appalling. We've got Shocking. court orders got away with for it. disclosure. They really should not, they should not be getting away with this. And the public, there needs to be a public outcry because this is so wrong. It could happen to anybody. In fact, it has happened the, to other people. On the judicial and this review, is though... It's shocking. Exactly. But it's like on the judicial review, we went for 27. We thought, right, 27 documents that we needed for the, our forensic scientists. And even though the judge at the judicial review saw the court orders, which were from 2001 and 2002, made by the appeal court judges, the high court judge said, no, you're not having the disclosure. I can't authorise that go to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. So it's, it's so wrong, our, we're it? constantly going in circle and circle and circle. And then in the past, when the Criminal Cases Review Commission have tried to obtain material, it's how they can't be found, or it's gone missing, or as it's police said, we don't have it anymore. And it's like, so where is it? Did you burn it in 1996 illegally, like you burnt so much other stuff? Or are you just still hiding it? Yeah, I have you got totally it? Honest. Let us have access to your storeroom and let's go and have a look what you've got. Because we know what we need. We know what you've got. So if you've no fear of they've us seeing the evidence, let us in that room. They've definitely admitted that they're still withholding information because Peter Tatchell wrote to them. And it, it was, um, as you said, a reply to say that, yes, they, they basically are withholding information. But why? Why do it? It's not these present police officers and nothing to do with the police officers in 1985. So why are they still protecting them? It doesn't make Interest, them look good. Interesting. If they were right. to just release the, the information, I don't expect an apology, but for withholding it for so long, just release the information. Exactly. Very, very simple. I mean, interestingly enough, we applied to the forensic archive from what material they had, Jeremy made an application to them. This was going back about six years, five years. And um, we went to the ICO. We've been all over the place, the Information Commissioner's Office. And what happened was in 2012, Huntington Laboratory, who conducted all the forensic tests on the exhibits in the case, closed. So... Obviously, they've got all these files then on many, many cases that they've worked on. So those files were sent to the Forensic Archive in Birmingham, and they are stored there. So we've applied to the Forensic Archive in Birmingham, opened in 2012, and said, please can we have access to Jeremy's forensic files? No. So I went to the Information Commissioner's officer and said, they won't let us have the files. It's a public organisation. You should be able to make a uh, disclosure to us, even if it's a freedom of information request. They should make disclosure to us. Absolutely. Eventually, eventually, Jeremy got a letter from them which said that they couldn't disclose any files to us because they had signed a confidentiality agreement with Essex Police. Now, Ooh, this I is sad. Yeah. After the court orders, 10 years after the court orders for full disclosure have been signed off by the appeal court judges, Essex Police made the Forensic Archive sign a confidentiality agreement that they wouldn't let our scientists, our solicitors, us or the um, Jeremy have access to these forensic files. So what, the question is, why not? Well, it's, it just looks like a massive cover-up. Anybody hearing that would think the same thing. Because why would you go to those lengths to stop information from a science lab from coming out? Exactly. What purpose have they got? Only to cover up something that's there. They're afraid of something? Yeah, but the thing is, Heidi, we don't need that evidence 
to prove Jeremy is innocent. We didn't need, it would, yeah, oh yeah, we would love that evidence because it's going to assist our scientists and there's certain things that we really do need for our scientists. But as proving Jeremy is innocent, we can do that in so many ways without that disclosure. So if they think that, if the Essex police think, well, we'll withhold this because they can't build a case without that. I'm very sorry, Essex police, but you're going to have to uh, face the facts very soon that we have actually got multiple instances. We have multiple areas that prove Jeremy is innocent. And you're going to have to a lot of questions to answer in the next few months. <laughs> Do you know what struck me very, very hard about the drama? What struck me was the lack of Robert Bowflower. Robert Bowflower was not mentioned spoken about or made an appearance in that drama and yet Robert Bowfly was the one who was nagging the police constantly ringing them changing his grandmother Jeremy's grandmother's will constantly on at the police oh Jeremy wore a wetsuit Jeremy rode his mum's bike Jeremy made farm tracks you know and this was the man who was absolutely relentless in going to the police to say Jeremy's guilty Jeremy did this Sheila couldn't have done this and yet he didn't even make a mention in the drama. Very odd. Well, the interesting thing is, because um, we know who Robert Bortflower is, he's passed away now, but um, he's actually the uncle of Jeremy and Sheila. His wife, Pamela, is the sister to June Bamber, who is um, Sheila and Jeremy's mother. So they're all very closely related. Also, um, it was Robert Bortflower and his wife, Pamela, who have two children, Anne Eaton, who moved into White House Farm um, not long after the shootings. Ha that actually happened there, which is a bit bizarre. And then you have her brother, David, who is the person who found the sound moderator at White House Farm, the gun cupboard, which is after the police had searched the property, which was later used as evidence. So Robert Bortflower is is really, um, he pins everybody together. He's the older person of the family. And, um, you know, he obviously has a lot to say in the family, which has come out in statements. He was very involved with the police and what was happening. And he was very so why close was he to... Where was he in the drama? That's a very good point. Why didn't they exactly. use it? Exactly, where was he? And he was very close. He had a very close relationship and friendship with the man who took over being the senior lead investigator when Julie, on the 6th of September, just before Julie Mugford um, was questioned. And so DCI Ainsley, who retired as a DSI Ainsley, funnily enough, after the whole Jeremy was arrested, charged, convicted, what happened to DSI Ainsley? He went to work for Robert Beaufort on the caravan site as head of security. Now, Amazing. not telling me that a senior police officer will go and work as a security guard on the caravan site for what a massive cutting pay, would it really? I don't think so. No. Uh, no, there seems to so. be. There was uh, a lot more to their relationship a than we know. Definitely a connection. I think Robert Bolt. Uh, played a massive part in Jeremy being convicted, massive part in being arrested, you know, and um... absolutely. So, I think I, the whole family I did. Have, I now have another question for you. Well, be kind. Um, this kind one is all amusing. This one, this one, oh, that's a very straightforward yes or no, really. This one is just bizarre. It's been claimed in the past that Jeremy wore a wetsuit to commit crimes <laughs> so that there was no forensic evidence on him. But he didn't wear a wetsuit, so forensic stuff would have gone on him, and yet there's no forensic evidence that actually links Jeremy to the crime anyway. Exactly. So what's well, this wetsuit all about? This is Uncle Robert. Uncle Robert Balfour told the oh, police. Yeah. yeah, it's Uncle Robert told the police that Jeremy's clothes didn't have any blood on them, so he must have worn something. So a hat, he must have had a wet suit on. 
It's Jeremy owned a wetsuit, so he must have had the wetsuit on in order to conduct the murders and not get any blood on him. But there was an additional extra factor of why the wetsuit would help, because Anne Eaton and the police looked at Jeremy, who had a T-shirt on, and didn't see a mark, a scratch, nothing, no bruises, no scratches on his faces, no black eyes, no, absolutely no marks on him whatsoever, which if it had been involved in this struggle with Neville in the kitchen, if it had been involved in the massacre of his family, he would have had scratch marks or some marks on him, a bruise or anything, nothing. So Robert Balfour Robert. also said that the wetsuit would have protected him from injury. But Incredible then story. what they said was that Jeremy went for a couple of days away at the invite of friends to Eastbourne, so just after the tragedy, it's the weekend after to get away from the Bay media. I mean, it must have been horrendous. Yeah. So friends said, come away with us to Eastbourne for the weekend. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Uncle Robert said the reason he went to Eastbourne was to wash the wetsuit in the salt water to get rid of the blood. Really? He lived on the river Blackwater. He had a very good imagination. We've also got um, a story that's come out and does keep on being repeated and repeated in the media um, over the years. Um, it says that the media have claimed that Jeremy sold new photogra nude photographs of Sheila. What's the truth about that then? Why was he doing this? Was he doing that? No, Jeremy Did didn't sell nude to photographs. Do it? Making money? Wow. No. <laughs> so the way this goes is that on the 16th of September, Jeremy and Brett Collins met with a journalist from the Sun newspaper in the pub. So it was in the Nags Head, actually, in Chelmsford. So Brett had organised this discussion with the journalist because he wanted to be able for Jeremy to give his story of what had happened. I mean, this is 16th of September. So, you know, been in for all this questioning with the police. It'd been charged with the burglary at the caravan park and the son wanted a story. So, and they met Michael Fielder. Now, Michael Fielder raised the issue to Jeremy. Have you, have you got any nude photographs of Sheila? Um, and from there, this story had developed. Now, these are photographs of Sheila, who was apparently sunbathing in the field. Colin had taken the photographs and she was naked. But earlier than that, on the 7th of September, Colin had gone to Sheila's flat to collect property belonging to the children. So he'd gone to collect the children's items and clothing and books and everything. And also some items that he wanted to keep that were Sheila's. And one of them was a portfolio and some negative slides that Jeremy had come across while he was cleaning Sheila's flat and, and you know, making things so that Colin could pick them up. So this was the 7th of September. Now, Colin admitted in a witness statement that he took these things home. He'd taken the slides home, he'd taken the photographs of Sheila home. And in fact, he put them in a bin bag and when he got home and put them out for the bin men to collect. And in fact, handed them to the bin man so that he knew that they would, go, they would be gone and they would be destroyed. Um, but it was like, Nine days later, that Jeremy met Michael Field, the journalist in the pub. So Colin already had the photographs. So how possibly can Jeremy have tried to sell him the photographs of Sheila when Colin already had them? He'd already destroyed them. So, no, that is another complete mm. manipulation of the facts in order to discredit Jeremy's character. It's not true. Yes, I think we're debunking quite a few myths here. Of course, people read it, they, they believe it, and it's not always the truth. And that's something we have to realise, that when you're reading things, you know, things can be exaggerated, misunderstood. It's like playing Chinese whispers, but really and truly, you know, this is pretty shocking stuff. And so to get the truth about what actually happened is really, exactly. really important. But it's not just us saying this, Heidi. We're not just like saying, oh, no, Jeremy didn't do this because blah, blah, blah. We've got it documented. 
So this is how we know it's factual because everything that we say, we're not making assumptions. We're not creating scenarios. We are basing everything we say on factual evidence that's taken in police statements, witness statements, because Colin's own statement says he collected these photographs. Colin's own statement says, I disposed of them by putting them in the dustbin. Yeah. Yeah, you can't get better than that, can you? What, what, and that was on the 7th of the September. Yeah. This, you this know, is the thing. We, we, I think it's a campaign. I think people need to realise that we're working on facts. We're not working on, oh, maybe this happened or maybe that happened and making that up. But everybody can have an opinion, but we have to have, particularly if you're going to put something forward to the CCLC, it has to be factual. We have to have the documents. We can't just make it up. And that's, that's no, really, really exactly. to understand. You know, and the amount of time it takes to extract the evidence. So, like, you know, that with Colin and the photographs is in a statement, but you've got to interlink what everybody's saying. So it's like, okay, what did the journalist say about this? Okay, so what did Brett Colin say about this? Because everyone forgets he arranged this. He arranged this meeting with the son in the next head. So, you know, what does he have to say about it? So what that, what does Colin say about it? And when you actually put the facts together, it's nothing like what's de being depicted in these, you know, shocking documentaries that are not based on any facts whatsoever. Um, no, I think we expect the documentary to be more accurate than a drama. I think most people understand dramas are dramatised. Uh, you know, the giveaway is in the name. But documentaries get it wrong. It's pretty shocking. Documentaries do, yeah, but they're not prepared to... You see, a lot of documentaries in the past are based on badly researched books. So they see something written, or in newspaper reports, so they see something written, and then they go, oh, that must be true, because it was in the yeah. sun. And that must be true, because it was in it was in this paper, or that paper, or in the mail. Or, and then it's like, automatically, you know, then an author picks it up and thinks, oh, it says this in the mail, right, I'll put that in my book because that's quite a good line, that is. And it's like, but it's all fictional. Yeah. You know, come to us and say to us, you give us the document, we'll show you the document and we'll show you the truth. But people don't, ITV exactly. went to ITV, prime example. When we knew that the drama was being made, fine, you're making a drama. but. Mm -hmm. We can give you the evidence, you know. So come to us, ask us what's new. We'll show you the evidence. Make it as factual as you can. You know, don't just make something for the sake of making it. Make it for a purpose and that it's, you know, no, not interested. The writer wasn't interested. Nobody was interested. We were ignored. Like I said earlier, they didn't want to go and see Jeremy. They were not interested in seeing who the real person was. I mean, I've never known a, docu a, a drama based on a person that you could go to see, that you could, you know, could, arrangements could be made for you to talk to that person, and you're absolutely, nah, I'll just get an image in my head of what I'm going to play them. You know, it's... I, it's... Strongly, I strongly suspect had Freddie Fox, um, okay, so he was going on advice, he says, had he actually gone to see Jeremy, even spoken to him on the phone, I don't think his betrayal would have been the same. I honestly don't see that he could have changed him so dramatically from what he's really like. Exactly. Actually... And I'm sure if they'd have taken the time to interact with Jeremy and to talk to Jeremy, that they'd have had a different perspective of not only who Jeremy is, but that he is an innocent man, and that he is being, you know, he's the victim. He is, I always refer to him as the sixth victim. Because you know there was there was five people died on the seventh of August nineteen eighty five, but Jeremy's had to suffer this for almost thirty six years, and he's a victim too, because he's been victimized. Yep. He's been character assassinated. He's been incarcerated in a jail for almost thirty six years, cut off from friends, family. He hasn't he's been denied such a lot. And yet he's resilient, he's strong. He knows he's innocent. And what else does he need? He knows he's innocent. Well, and the other thing is, well, is that 
you know, the, the, the general perception, and has actually been stated again in many media and books, Jeremy's a psychopath. That's why he did it. He's a psychopath. But that's not the truth, is it? That's not true at all. Jeremy has psychopathy tests done within the jail. He's had about 27, over 27 different psychologists. He's had the hair test, which is a very highly recognised um, way to find out if somebody is a psychopath or not. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming that he's not. Uh, you cannot fool so many people. Um, there's another test that's done and he, you know. It's the Oasis test. Oh, that was what I was yeah. trying to think of. It's the Oasis test. And Jeremy's score on that is like, it barely even registers a score. It's that low. Well, I mean, it's, even, even, it's even been said that he's, he, he's more um, psychologically stable than the vast majority of the population, virtually. In other words, Absolutely. he's got no mental health issues. But in fact, it's quite incredible that he's considering he's been in prison for so many years as an innocent man. But he's not a psychopath. So and why he has no he personality disorders. I mean, he's, he's recently had an independent um, psychologist evaluation for his security status review. You know, and there is there is nothing. There's no triggers, no alarms. It's no, you know, personality traits. Absolutely nothing. So yes. I think. Half of it is that people need a reason to blame Jeremy. So by giving him a label of a psychopathic monster makes it like, oh, this psychopath murdered all his family, when really, deep down, they know Jeremy is innocent. And because the, how does it feel for a, a, an innocent person with no mental health issues, no personality traits, no Psych psychopathy noted nothing passed a lie detector test with flying colors which he requested and was constantly refused a lie detector test i think it took him seven eight years to get that lie detector a test and he passed it with flying colors but then oh no well you know that, well, that's wrong because psychopaths can fool a uh, uh, lie detector test you know, how ridiculous. I mean, why would he request one in the first place? How risky would that have been Absolutely. if he was guilty? Yeah. You know? So, right, what we've got is somebody who is not a psychopath and therefore was able to take a lie detector test, which he asked to do. It took him a long time and then they agreed to it. So it's quite a test case, really. And he passes it, flying colours. There wasn't any any indication whatsoever that he was lying. And the questions were very direct, very specific. And in order to, to get those correct, there wasn't even a fuzzy in between. He's had, oh, of course, people do wonder how many lie detector tests he's taken. It's one. It Just is one. one. Um, we have had uh, a polygraph expert approach us because there's a new polygraph out now which goes off your eyes. So it works from your eyes. So it's not mentioning temperature or skins or, or heart rate or anything like that. Uh, this goes off your eyes and it's brand new. And the, they have suggested it. I, did, I think Jeremy has applied for it, but, it, you know, it's unlikely they'll allow it because he has had one lie detector test, which passed, as Heidi said, with flying colours. I very much doubt they'll allow him this second even more accurate, what's supposed to be absolutely irrefutable lie detector test, because, but he doesn't need it because he passed the first one. So it's not needed. Yeah, it's not but, a best of three, is it? Let's not do, let's do three uh, and maybe of three. pass us all three. Let's do another one just to make sure it's not like that. This is, yeah, this is a very professional, well-recognised um person that actually does terry mullins who is um actually performed many of these uh, polygraph tests since on on prisoners and um with accurate again accurate outcomes it certainly Absolutely. wasn't um you know it doesn't have a question mark over it do you? and that's where we'll have to leave it for today well there are still lots of questions and lots of myths in jeremy bamba's case so chas is there any forensic evidence against Jeremy? Did he have to drug Sheila to get her to be compliant? Was Julie Mugford involved in the murders? 
And what was Taff Jones really like? And most importantly, could she handle a rifle? Or could she load a magazine? Find out next time in the next episode of Myths and Facts with me and Heidi. See you soon. 